Okay, the next segment is going to introduce some of the linguistic background as well as some of the mathematical background needed for this class. So as I told you at the beginning of the class, uh, we're going to uh, look at NLP from a slightly more linguistic perspective than other courses on this topic. So I want first to introduce you to the basic of, basics of linguistics. Uh, a little bit of it is not going to be even very useful for this class, but I want you to get a coherent picture of the main topics in linguistics. So let's look at some of the issues that arise uh, in NLP that have their origins in the linguistics community. For example, the idea of a constituent. So what is a constituent in linguistics? It is a unit of uh, the syntax of a sentence that has a, a specific uh, role. So for example, if I have the sentence children eat pizza or the sentence they eat pizza, in both cases, I have the underlying fragment indicating the subject of the sentence. Those can be replaced with each other and the sentence would still be grammatical. Or I can say, my cousin's neighbor's children eat pizza. As you can see, all of those three underlined expressions can be the subject of the sentence. Therefore, they have something in common. What it will turn out to be is that they're all noun phrases because they can be all subjects of a sentence. You can see that the length actually doesn't really matter. And the fact that the second word is not even a noun, it's a pronoun, also doesn't matter. What's most important is that all those three items can be the subjects of the same sentence. Now, you can even have instances where the subject of a sentence is not explicitly mentioned. For example, if I tell you, eat pizza, I mean that you should be eating the pizza. So you are the implicit subject of the sentence, but because uh, of the way I formulated the sentence as an imperative, as an order, the subject is not explicitly marked. We also need to know about the things about collocations. So collocations are groups of words that appear more frequently together than you would expect by chance and typically have some specific meaning. For example, uh, even though the word strong is a synonym of powerful in most contexts, we can say that some beer is strong, but we cannot say that that beer is powerful. So two synonyms cannot be always interchangeable. An even funnier example, you can say that this is my big sister, but you cannot say this is my large sister, even though big and large are often synonyms. Now, an example that I was looking for uh, in the news uh, has to do with the word rise versus ascend. It turns out that in the past, uh, when I first did this experiment, maybe 10 years ago, people would never say stocks ascend Instead, they would say stocks rise all the time. There were 225,000 hits on Google for the former and only 47 of the latter one. But when I did this experiment for this class, it turns out that uh, stocks ascend is now a much more acceptable collocation. There were, in fact, 57,000 instances of that on Google. But still, uh, we have a major difference in the frequency of those two collocations uh, in the 10 to 1 ratio. So how do we get this kind of linguistic knowledge in the NLP system? Well, there are essentially two approaches. One is some sort of manual rules that tell you, well, uh, big sister means this and large sister means something completely different. And you have to encode those uh, as part of the knowledge of the system by hand. Or you can automatically acquire this kind of rules from large text collections, also known as corpora. So what kind of knowledge about language is needed? Well, those are all the areas of linguistics. Phonetics and phonology, which are the study of sounds. For example, what are consonants and vowels and which consonants are stops versus fricatives. Uh, morphology, which is the study of word components. For example, in the, in the word impossible, im is a prefix that means negation and impossible means something that is not possible. Syntax is the study of sentence and phrase structure. What is the subject of the sentence? What is the object? What is the verb? Lexical semantics is the study of the meanings of individual words. Compositional semantics is how to combine words and uh, segments of sentences and to understand the meaning of the combined sentence. Pragmatics is how to accomplish goals. And then discourse conventions is about dealing with units of text that are larger than single utterances or single sentences. For example, 
you can have a multi-sentential uh, paragraph where each additional sentence somehow refers to the first sentence by using pronouns and other forms of reference. There will be a separate lecture on uh, the different levels of language later on this class. Now, from computer science, uh, we can look at some techniques like finite state automaton. So, finite state automaton is a machine that consists of states and transitions. Uh, so one of the states is the start state, and you can also have one or more uh, final or accept states. Uh, in this example here, state zero is the start state. It's indicated by a solid circle, a solid line circle. And state number 13 is an accept state, and that is denoted by the double uh, circle. Uh, the transitions go as follows. From state zero to state one, you have the letter C. From state one to state two, you have the letter A. From state two to state three, you have the letter T. Then there is a space from three to four, and so on. So the whole uh, automaton here is used to encode the sequence of three words, cat, space, cats, space, dogs. Another automaton, known as a transducer, can be then combined with the previous automaton uh, to perform some sort of phonological or morphological analysis of the sentence. So the second automaton here starts in state zero, and then it has multiple paths. So let's look at them in detail. The top path has three consecutive edges. The first edge converts C to a zero, where zero is, indicates the empty string in this uh, example. Then the next edge is from one to two. It takes as input the letter A and it produces the empty string as output. And finally, the third transition goes from state two to state three. It reads in a T, the letter T, and it produces a capital N. And then it goes to state number three, which is an acceptable final state. So if we perform a specific operation on the two automata that you can see on the screen, that specific operation is called composition, what is going to happen is that we're going to read the C, the A, and the T from the input on the top and convert that sequence into the sequence empty string followed by empty string followed by capital N. So in a sense, we did a very simple morphological analyzer slash part of speech tagger. We labeled the word cat as a noun. And if uh, the input string cat had stopped right there, we would have been in an accept state, number three, and we would have just produced the noun label and stopped. However, our input contains three words, and uh, the middle automaton has uh, the capability of processing all of those three words and producing the correct labels for them. So let's uh, see if we can trace it. So we already did the part where we look at C-A-T and we label this as a noun, N. Now, the next uh, symbol on the input is a space. Well, the space takes us from state three to state zero and doesn't produce any output. So we can essentially go back to the beginning. Then we have a C-A-T-S. In the second automaton, that takes us through the same path as before, and we produce an N going from state 0 to state 1 to state 2 and to state 3. But then the S now takes us to state 6, but now we're going to produce a P on the output tape. And that will tell us that the word cats is a noun plural. We could stop here, but since there is more input to process, we have to go back. Uh, from state 6 to the beginning, state 0, the input is an empty string, or rather a space in this case, and the output is an empty string. So we go back to state 0, and we have now the word dogs. So this is processed by going from state 0 to state 4, then to state 5, then to state 3, in which case we output the letter N. Then uh, we have one more letter in the input, the letter S, which gets translated into a capital P. And now at this point, both the uh, input string and the so-called transducer are in an accept state. Therefore, we can stop and we can just produce the output that you see at the bottom of the screen. So let's read it carefully here. Uh, the output has two labels on each edge. Uh, the first label comes from the input and the second label comes from the transducer. 
So if we read it left to right by only focusing on the first label on each edge, we're going to get the original string, which is cat space cats space dogs. Now, if we read the second label on each transition, we're going to produce the output of this part of speech tagger. So let's try to do this here. Empty string, empty string, capital N, which is the label for cat, followed by empty string, empty string, empty string, capital N, capital P, which is the label for the word cats as a noun a plural, followed by a few empty strings, followed by capital N and capital P, which is the label for the plural noun dogs. So at this point in time, the transducer has finished its work and we can just produce the output which consists of the second labels on every transition. So N, NP, NP. So this was just a small illustration how uh, techniques that come from uh, theoretical computer science such as finite state automata are used in natural language processing. There are other areas of co theoretical computer science that find uh, th that are useful in natural language processing. In addition to automata, uh, the kind that I just showed you, there is also push-down automata which are used to process more uh, sophisticated grammars and uh, in a few weeks you will see how they work. We also need to import some uh, techniques from computer science that deal with grammars, specifically regular grammars, context-free grammars, context-sensitive grammars, and some other kinds of grammars, which again will be covered in this course later on this semester. There are also issues related to the complexity of the different algorithms, and uh, for example, uh, how long does it take to process an input of a certain size? And finally, there's aspects of programming, such as dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a specific algorithm that is used to uh, produce uh, an output that depends on the sequence on the input. And it's much more efficient than trying all the possible combinations on the input. So we will talk about dynamic programming later in this class. Uh, now, in addition to linguistics and computer science, there are areas in NLP that originate in uh, mathematics and statistics. The whole use of probabilities to indicate that different sentences are likely to a different extent. The use of statistical models, hypothesis testing, linear algebra, as well as optimization and numerical methods. We are going to see some of those techniques in action later this semester as well. Some additional mathematical and computational tools that are popular in natural language processing include language models, which are used to uh, determine the probability of a certain sequence of symbols or words, estimation methods, context-free grammars for trees, hidden Markov models or conditional random fields for sequences, and then also different statistical models such as uh, different generative and discriminative models and maximum entropy models. Some techniques from statistics that are used in natural language processing are briefly mentioned here. Uh, one is the so-called vector space representation for word sense disambiguation, which we're going to talk about uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, the noisy channel model for machine translation. I'm going to illustrate those two here at the bottom of the slide. The left-hand side shows you how different documents can be represented as vectors in a vector space. So we have here two documents, D1 and D2 and a query, Q, all, all three of those are represented as vectors, and we can determine which of the two documents, D1 or D2, is more similar to the query Q by looking at the angle between that document and the query. So the angle between D1 and Q is alpha, the angle between D2 and Q is theta. And in this case, it's pretty obvious that theta is a larger angle than alpha, and therefore document one is actually a better match to the query Q. The example on the right is uh, the so-called noisy channel model for machine translation. It is based on an idea that originated in speech processing. And the idea is very simple. We assume that uh, when we have two languages and we want to translate between them, we assume that one of the languages is an encoded version of the other language. So if we want to translate some text from French to English, we are going to try to identify which string in English is most likely given the French string. And this is uh, then converted using the Bayesian theorem into uh, the second expression on the right. And then it's also simplified into the third expression on the right 
knowing that the probability of the French uh, sentence does not change when you change the English sentence. So you can just assume that for ranking purposes, the sentence in English that maximizes the conditional probability of E given F can be computed the same way even if you didn't know the value of the probability of the French sentence. And finally, the third technique that is used in natural language processing that originates in statistics is the so-called uh, random walk method. Uh, a random walk method takes a graph and uses what is known as a Monte Carlo simulation uh, to label the nodes of the graph using uh, different uh, uh, values. So this is useful for tasks in natural language processing such as sentiment analysis where you have as input a sentence that can be either positive or negative and then you want to label some additional sentences as either se uh, negative or positive uh, by looking at the examples that you have seen so far. There are some techniques in natural language processing that originate in artificial intelligence uh, and I'm going to list just a few here. Those include logic, specifically first order logic and predicate calculus. Those are ways to represent the meaning of sentences. Uh, the idea of agents uh, or essentially uh, entities that communicate with each other using speech acts. The idea of planning, how do you plan a sentence, uh, how do you decide what goes into the sentence and how do you decide that you want to render it in a certain way. And also a few more techniques that uh, we are going to focus a little bit on later on the semester such as constraint satisfaction and machine learning. So the next topic is going to be an introduction to linguistics as uh, needed for this class.